Hello and welcome to Dot Play's Chemistry Lessons. Today we're going to be looking at transition metals and colour from the AQA A Level Chemistry course. Quick reminder that uh, the website drclaysalevelchemistry.com is now up and running. Come along and see the revision webinars and all the resources. You can find the link in the cards in the top right hand corner of the next screen. So by the end of this lesson, you should be able to do the following. Explain why transition metals appear colored and why they change color. And recall how simple colorimetry can be used to identify the concentration of unknown solutions. So why do transition metals have color? Well, to do this, we're gonna take this imaginary sample of Fe, 2 plus. Now Fe2 plus has got the electron configuration of argon 3d6. And here I've got a picture of a uh, profile of energy up the left hand side and I'm just showing the 3d orbitals. So I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and you'll notice that one of the d orbitals is paired. Now let's imagine that some ligands, uh, we might assume that these might be water or something simple like that, come and bind to the central metal iron. So we now have Fe2 plus with six water ligands surrounding it. The result of this is it splits the 3D orbitals into two further levels, a higher and a lower energy level. This higher and lower energy level are still d orbitals, so we're still looking here at three d orbitals in both of these cases. Uh, it's just that they've they split slightly. We call the lower one t two g and the higher one e uh, e g star. Though that d d is no relevance at all. You don't need to know about that at this level. The important thing is there is a difference in energy which we describe as delta E between these two energy levels. And the other thing is these energy levels are incomplete. In other words, electrons can move between them. So they're split into two and we now have this scenario where we've got six 3D electrons in two different energy levels split by an energy gap delta E. In itself, this doesn't cause the substance to have any particular color. It's when we're now looking at a picture of these 3D orbital again. When light energy is absorbed on this molecule, the electron here, it doesn't actually matter which one, can jump up an energy level. Now, the process of it jumping up an energy level is it absorbs energy equivalent to the energy gap delta E. Now that energy gap we can describe as H mu where H is something called the Planck's constant And mu is the frequency of the light absorbed. In this case, we can also rewrite this as H is C over lambda, where lambda now is the wavelength. And this is the symbol for lambda here. So this is now the wavelength. We have a space there. And C is the speed of light. Importantly, we're now talking about wavelengths of light which are being absorbed. And therefore, this light energy that comes in is losing a certain amount of energy on the way out because it has been absorbed by the electron transferring from the lower to the higher orbital. We call this a D to D transition. 
and the light is absorbed. So just to summarize there, the complex absorbs visible light. The electron is excited from the lower d orbital to the higher one. The energy difference there is equivalent to the energy gap, which is delta E which is equal to H mu, where H is a Planck constant, mu is a frequency of light, and that can be rearranged for H Planck constant multiplied by the speed of light divided by the wavelength. And then the observed color is a complementary light which is not absorbed, which we see is transmitted or reflected. So just to show you how that looks, incident light, well that simply means the light that's coming in. We might expect that to be white light. We'd have an object, and our object in this instance might be our complex. The light passes through the complex solution. And here we'd see that blue and green light is being absorbed by the complex. So in other words, that would be equivalent to the delta E, the energy gap. And the light not absorbed would be red, which is transmitted, passed through the substance and not absorbed, and uh, is seen by uh, the viewer on the other side. Or, equally, it could be reflected. We'll see as we go through that complexes change colour, and they do so for one of three important reasons. Here we can see an observation here with FeH2062 plus to FeH2063 plus. We're going from pale green to yellow. And in this particular example, the change in color is because there is a change in oxidation state of the metal. And this is simply going to change the energy gap that we were observing before. In this next example, we've got the complex of cobalt hexaqua iron, and then we're at an oxidation state of plus two on the left and plus two on the right. Um, we can see we're going from a pink color on the left to a straw color on the right. The change here though, is we are seeing a change in ligand. And we will see that uh, this is a ligand substitution reaction the ligand will alter the energy gap as well. The final example then, here we've got a copper complex on the left and the right. The oxidation state remains the same. We're going from a blue color to a yellow. We are seeing a slight change in, uh, ox in ligand. We're going from water to Cl minus, but importantly, we are changing the coordination number of the complex here. And we're going from an octahedral shape to a tetrahedral shape. So these are the three reasons we may observe a change in colour in one of our complex solutions. We'll see these a lot more when we look at the reactions of metal aqua ions later on. Finally then, in this video, we can look at colorimetry and how we can use colorimetry to determine the concentration of unknown samples. Now, this isn't a required practical, but it is in the specification to know about as a technique to use for uh, working out unknown concentrations. So you may well be asked about this in the exam, although it's not one of the 12 required practicals for the A2 course. The way it works is you've got a source of white light here, which we pass through a filter. This is so we get a maximum in our reading. We then have a sample of our complex, which we pass the light through. And then we finally measure the amount of light that is absorbed via passing through the sample. Now, this, importantly, has to be done in conjunction with something called a calibration curve. So we have to, first of all, calibrate the equipment before we can take any readings. So in order to do this experiment, what we do is we take a known concentration of solution and we make a series of dilutions. 
for each of those dilutions we take a measurement using our calorimeter and we measure the absorbance of the known solutions and then we plot a calibration curve and actually what i should have said in the middle of this before taking any absorbance measurement we would always zero the calorimeter with an some with distilled water as a reference once we've done this we might plot a calibration curve here like we've got at the bottom right hand corner where we've got relative absorbance reading against known concentration on the side so then once we've got our calibration curve we then measure the absorbance of the unknown sample that's which we got here and then we would simply read off the unknown concentration off the calibration curve giving us a way to determine the unknown concentration of a complex ion Okay, thanks for watching. Now you should be able to explain why transition metals appear coloured and why they change colour. Recall how simple calorimetry can be used to identify the concentration of unknown solutions. And do go and check out the website, lots of other resources and live webinars coming soon.